April 27, 2011. Forecasters had already counted hundreds of tornadoes, but something worse was brewing over Alabama. Within minutes, a supercell would unleash an EF5 tornado that tore entire towns apart, left 71 dead, erased factories, and plunged nearly one million people into darkness. But how did one storm become the deadliest of the outbreak, while emergency systems raced to keep up? The answer begins with a single warning. Between April 25th and April 28th, 2011, the United States faced a tornado outbreak of a magnitude that stunned even seasoned meteorologists. Over four relentless days, 368 tornadoes tore across the country, marking the largest outbreak ever recorded in modern American history. The devastation stretched from Texas to New York, but the heart of the crisis pulsed in Alabama. On April 27th alone, tornadoes claimed 316 lives, a single day that stands as the deadliest for tornado fatalities since the National Weather Service began keeping official records in 1950. The numbers alone tell a story of national alarm. Meteorological models showed a rare convergence of atmospheric ingredients, a deep trough in the jet stream, a surge of warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico, and wind shear levels that exceeded 60 knots. Instability, measured by Cape values, soared to twice the threshold typically needed for tornado formation. The entire southeast became a canvas for violent weather, with Alabama and Tennessee appearing as a glaring target on every weather map. The Storm Prediction Center issued a high-risk outlook, a designation reserved for the most dangerous and volatile setups. It was only the second time in history that such a warning had covered so wide an area. As dawn broke on April 27th, sirens began to wail. Emergency alerts interrupted radio and television broadcasts, while social media filled with warnings and pleas for shelter. For families in Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Hackleburg, and rural communities scattered across the state, it became a day defined by uncertainty and fear. Some sought refuge in basements or storm shelters, while others huddled in interior rooms, listening as the wind roared and debris battered their homes. The sheer volume of tornadoes overwhelmed emergency services. In some towns, first responders could not reach survivors for hours, as roads were blocked by fallen trees and power lines. Hospitals activated disaster protocols, bracing for a surge of injured residents. The scale of the outbreak forced a reckoning with the nation's preparedness. Entire communities were left unrecognizable, their landmarks erased in minutes. In Alabama, the destruction was so widespread that the National Guard was mobilized to assist with rescue and recovery. The Red Cross opened dozens of shelters, and volunteers arrived from across the country. The event's scope was reflected in the numbers. 368 tornadoes, 316 deaths in a single day, thousands of homes destroyed, and entire towns left to pick through the remains of what had been familiar streets and neighborhoods. The 2011 super outbreak was more than a meteorological anomaly. It was a national emergency that exposed the vulnerability of even the most prepared communities. Alabama, marked as ground zero, would soon face a tornado whose path and power would become the focus of intense study and remembrance. A storm that would define a generation's understanding of nature's capacity for destruction. West of Hamilton, Alabama, Meteorologists tracked a supercell on radar that was unlike any other forming that afternoon. Computer screens in National Weather Service offices lit up with velocity couplets, signatures that pointed to intense, organized rotation deep within the storm. Forecasters toggled between base reflectivity and velocity scans, watching as inbound and outbound winds tightened into a classic hook echo. The threat was not hypothetical anymore. Algorithms flagged the cell for rapid intensification, and the projected path stretched for nearly 100 miles, crossing county after county in northern Alabama. At the National Weather Service offices in Birmingham and in Huntsville, the mood shifted from analytical to urgent. The AWIPS chat system pinged with messages that read, 
Violent rotation. Possible debris signature. Prepare for emergency escalation. Meteorologists debated how much warning to give, knowing that hours of earlier alarms had already worn down public attention. But the data left little doubt. The storm's rotation was tightening rapidly, and dual polarization radar began showing signs of lofted debris, an unmistakable indicator that the tornado threat was imminent and severe. Within minutes, the standard tornado warning polygon was drawn. As new radar sweeps confirmed the storm's explosive growth, forecasters overrode protocol. They issued a tornado emergency, a rare highest level alert reserved only for situations when a large violent tornado is on the ground and heading toward populated areas. The wording was blunt, a particularly dangerous situation. Take shelter immediately. Emergency managers relayed the alert across radio, television, and digital networks. Dispatchers called local officials, urging them to activate sirens and open community shelters. The decision chain moved faster than usual. Meteorologists and emergency managers coordinated in real time, sharing updates on the storm's location, projected speed, and likely impact zone. The supercell's forward motion approached highway speeds, nearly 70 miles per hour, leaving little time for those in its path to act. Internal logs and chat transcripts from that afternoon show how quickly the situation escalated. As soon as debris signatures appeared, the language and alerts shifted from cautionary to life-saving. In homes and schools along the projected track, people received the new warnings with a mix of disbelief and dread. Many had already heard sirens earlier in the day, but the urgent tone of the tornado emergency cut through the fatigue. The storm's projected path, nearly a straight line across Marion, Franklin, Lawrence, and Limestone counties, meant that a single supercell could threaten dozens of communities in sequence. For the meteorologists watching from their screens and the emergency managers fielding calls from the public, the minutes before first impact were a blur of forecasts, warnings, and hope that the message would reach those who needed it most. The stage was set for a tornado event that would soon demand every ounce of preparation and resolve. At 3.05 in the afternoon, the tornado touched down in Marion County and quickly gathered strength as it tracked toward Hackleburg. Within minutes, what began as a swirling threat on radar became a force that would erase nearly everything in its path. The tornado expanded to three quarters of a mile wide, its roar swallowing the sounds of sirens and splintering wood. Well-built homes, some anchored with poured concrete and steel bolts, were swept clean from their foundations. Vehicles landed hundreds of feet from where they started. Debris from the Wrangler Distribution Center, once the town's lifeblood, rained down across fields and roads, denim scraps caught in the branches of stripped trees. Hackleburg's main street vanished beneath piles of brick and tangled steel. The high school, a center of the community, took a direct hit. Inside, band director Patsy Brown gathered students into the narrowest hallway she could find. As the building shook and walls collapsed around them, Brown's calm steadied the group. When the noise finally faded and daylight crept through the wreckage, every student who had followed her survived. In the days that followed, Brown helped organize makeshift classes and comfort those who had lost family and friends, her quiet leadership becoming a symbol of the town's resilience. The destruction was nearly total. 75% of Hackleburg lay in ruins. 18 residents lost their lives, some in homes, others in vehicles or at work. Emergency dispatchers fielded a flood of 911 calls. Many cut off mid-sentence as cell towers and power lines fell. In less than 10 minutes, a community was reduced to rubble, and the tornado pressed on, its path still widening as it crossed into Franklin County. The names and stories of those lost would echo through the weeks of funerals and rebuilding that followed, shaping the memory of a town forever changed. Phil Campbell, a quiet town in Franklin County, became the next target as the tornado crossed county lines. The storm widened to its maximum, stretching nearly one and a quarter miles across, an expanse that left little chance for escape. Forward speed reached an estimated 69 miles per hour, 
faster than many cars on the highway. Residents had only minutes, sometimes seconds, to react before the tornado bore down. The violence here was recorded in forensic detail. A section of pavement, 25 feet wide, was ripped clean from the ground, an unmistakable signature of the highest wind speeds ever measured in tornadoes. Trees were stripped bare, their bark sand-blasted away. Vehicles were hurled. One car found wrapped around a tree trunk. Others tossed so far they were never recovered. Site-built homes, some anchored to their foundations, disappeared entirely. Debris from houses, churches, and businesses was scattered in long, straight lines, a pattern known as wind rowing that only occurs in the most violent storms. First responders arrived to a landscape that defied belief. Roads were blocked by tangled wreckage and uprooted trees. The town's fire chief, Terry Hester, and his volunteers faced a scene where familiar landmarks had vanished. With ambulances unable to navigate the debris, makeshift triage areas were set up in open fields and along battered roadways. The urgent search for survivors began amid the silence left by the storm's passage, broken only by the calls of those trapped or injured. In and around Phil Campbell, 21 people lost their lives. The scale of loss was matched only by the storm's raw power. Forensic teams later traced the tornado's path by mapping scoured earth and the precise placement of debris, building a record of destruction that would help confirm the storm's EF5 rating. As the tornado pressed east, the evidence left behind in Franklin County stood as a stark measure of what nature, in its most violent form, can do. In the rural stretch between Phil Campbell and Mount Hope, the tornado's violence reached a level that left even seasoned survey teams searching for words. Here, the path widened again, cutting through farmland and small clusters of homes. Damage patterns in Oak Grove and Mount Hope would later become textbook evidence for the highest category of tornado on the enhanced Fujita scale. Well-built brick houses, anchored with steel bolts and poured concrete, were not just leveled, they were swept completely from their foundations. Engineers studying the aftermath found sheared anchor bolts, a sign that wind forces had overcome even modern construction standards. In some cases, the only trace of a home was a bare slab, with debris scattered hundreds of yards downwind in straight, wind road lines. One forensic detail stood out above all others. A Chevrolet Corvette, once parked in a garage, was found nearly 641 feet from where it started. Its mangled frame lay twisted in a field, a stark measure of the tornado's raw power. Vehicles of this size and weight are rarely thrown so far, even in strong tornadoes. For survey teams, that single data point, mapped by GPS and cross-checked with aerial imagery, became a critical marker confirming EF5 intensity. The same winds that hurled the Corvette also stripped bark from trees and scoured patches of earth down to bare soil. Rural residents faced devastation that was both total and isolating. In Oak Grove, families emerged from storm shelters to a landscape where not only their homes, but also the familiar lines of trees and barns had vanished. The loss of infrastructure, roads blocked by tangled debris, power lines snapped and draped across fields, compounded the sense of isolation. First responders, many of them local farmers or volunteer firefighters, navigated by memory through a landscape transformed beyond recognition. The forensic evidence gathered here would soon inform not only the storm's EF5 rating, but also the urgent questions about how such destruction could happen, despite modern building codes and warnings. As the tornado pressed deeper into northern Alabama, its destruction reached far beyond homes and farmland. The Tennessee Valley Authority's transmission network, a lifeline for nearly one million residents, took a direct hit. More than 350 high-voltage towers and poles crumpled in the storm's path, their twisted frames scattered across fields and roads. Transmission lines feeding power from Brown's Ferry nuclear plant snapped under the strain plunging entire cities and towns into darkness. At the TV, a control center, engineers watched as cascading failures tripped 
generating units offline, one after another. By nightfall, the blackout stretched across the Tennessee Valley, with over one million customers left without electricity, one of the largest outages in regional history. The tornado's impact did not stop with the grid. In Limestone County, the storm barreled through subdivisions and retail corridors along U.S. Highway 72. Entire neighborhoods were leveled in minutes as homes, businesses, and even the local Piggly Wiggly vanished. WAFF's private radar and rooftop camera, used by journalists to track storms in real time, were destroyed as the tornado crossed the highway, cutting off live coverage just as the need for information peaked. The storm's reach was no longer measured only in miles, but in the sudden silence that followed. Power gone, communications severed, and a region left to face the aftermath in the dark. After the tornado's devastating run through northern Alabama, the parent supercell pushed across the state line into Tennessee. Survey teams traced the damage path up to Madison County, then found a clear break. No continuous ground damage crossed into Tennessee. Radar scans confirmed the original tornado's circulation faded near the border, but the threat was far from over. Just minutes later, new rotation tightened within the same supercell, and at about 5.02 p.m., a fresh EF-3 tornado touched down near Huntland, Tennessee. This new EF-3 tornado carved a 10.5-mile track through Franklin County, widening to nearly 400 yards at its peak. Homes lost roofs and walls. Huntland Elementary School was heavily damaged, and trees snapped cleanly along the path. At least eight people were injured, though, unlike in Alabama, no fatalities were recorded. For survey teams, this was a distinct event. The gap in damage, the separate radar signature, and the timing all pointed to a new tornado, not a single unbroken path. The supercell's persistence made clear that even as one disaster ended, another could begin almost instantly, with the boundary between events sometimes measured only by a mile or a minute. Survey engineers walked the Hackleburg Phil Campbell track and found unmistakable signs of EF5 wind speeds. Well-constructed homes, bolted to their foundations, were swept completely away. Pavement was scoured from roads, trees were stripped bare of bark, and vehicles landed hundreds of yards from where they started. These markers, combined with the mapped debris fields and sheared steel anchor bolts, led to a wind speed estimate near 210 miles per hour. The enhanced Fujita scale only assigns an EF5 rating when destruction reaches this level, when even the strongest structures cannot withstand the force. The numbers that followed told their own story. 71 lives lost, more than 145 injured, and $1.29 billion in damages. Yet, amid the devastation, shelter managers in Hackleburg reported a rare outcome. Every person inside the overcapacity community shelter survived, even as the world outside was erased. Post-event analysis revealed a stark pattern. Those in reinforced shelters or interior rooms had the highest chance of survival while most fatalities occurred in mobile homes, vehicles, or poorly anchored structures. These findings have since shaped building codes, funding for safe rooms, and the way warnings are issued across Alabama. Tornado outbreaks like 2011 are no longer rare outliers. The Southeast now sees some of the nation's costliest and deadliest twisters. As urban growth spreads, the margin for survival tightens. Resilience isn't just about rebuilding, it's about readiness. The scars remain, but so does the lesson. Warnings save lives only if we're prepared to act on them, every time the sirens sound.